Good evening and welcome to another great decisions program co-sponsored by the Mead Public Library and the Sheboygan branch of the American Association of University Women. Great Decisions is a project of the Foreign Policy Association. They research eight timely topics and then they create a book and a CD which they make available to places like Sheboygan. <laughs> and um, we have a copy of the book which you can check out. It, I think it's at the back table. It has been before, at least. And you can also order a copy online from the Foreign Policy Association website. AEUW is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering girls and women. Locally, we give scholarships to non-traditional women students. And we sponsor candidate forums for the nonpartisan April elections for the mayor, the Sheboygan City Council, and the school board. Another project of our branch is our annual STEM Day for sixth to ninth grade girls, which will be held November 2nd at South High School. Um, that is to encourage girls to consider careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Last year we registered 86 girls. And uh, this year our event is November 2nd. There are some brochures on the back table if you're interested or know somebody who might be interested in attending. We are indebted to the work of Mead Librarian uh, Aubrey Lau for her work in arranging the schedule for our programs and to Ryan for his help with the AV. And I would also like to Scott, thank Scott Mieliff, uh, director of SCS, for arranging the taping of the programs to be shown later on WSCS. Tonight's topic is NATO's future, very timely, and will be presented by Martin Farrell. Marty recently retired after 44 years of college and university teaching political science and international relations, the last 40 years at Ripon College. He is the author of over 70 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and conference papers. He led students on 10 study abroad experiences, beginning with China in 1981, and also including Russia, Eastern Europe, and Italy. His own travel and research has taken him to 47 countries on six continents. He also recently retired from elective office after 28 years on the Fond du Lac County Board of Supervisors, the last 16 as chair. He continues to do independent research and make public presentations. He will speak for 45 minutes, after which we will have a 15-minute Q&A. Please welcome Martin Farrell. Thank you very much, Dulcie, and uh, uh, thank you to the AAUW for sponsoring the series, and of course also to the uh, library staff, Aubrey and Ryan, uh, for your expert assistance in setting things up tonight. I know there's a very important uh, debate coming up tonight that I'm sure many of you want to watch, and last year I did run a little bit long. I'm going to uh, make every effort this year to make sure I don't do that. Uh, but I also want to say how much I enjoy coming to Sheboygan. I really thank you for having me here. Uh, we love Sheboygan. We come over here just for fun. We brought relatives over here just a few weeks ago. Enjoy your beautiful parks, your state parks, your county parks, your museums, your great restaurants, uh, probably even more things to yet be discovered, but uh, you have a great community here, and it's a pleasure to come over. So in the interest of uh, trying to be a little bit more succinct tonight, I thought I would try to address the question, NATO's future, with a succinct answer. It depends. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> No, seriously, uh, obviously, there's a lot up in the air right now. And one of the biggest things is probably the outcome of the American presidential election. Because we know Donald Trump has not been a big fan of NATO. 
Uh, recently, he said he was speaking to one of the presidents of one of the member countries. These are the 32 countries currently members of NATO. It's one of these people, uh, apparently. And the person asked him, will you really protect us if Russia attacks us? And by his own account, uh, Mr. Trump's answer was, well, it all depends. If you've paid up your dues, we might. But if you haven't, I'm going to tell them to do whatever the hell they want. Now, that's not really quite reassuring. Uh, for one thing, it's not accurate to say that they haven't paid their dues. That we'll see how NATO is funded, and that is not really the issue. Nobody owes NATO or the United States any money. What is at issue is that some of the countries are still trying to meet the agreed upon goal of defense spending in their own budget on their own military uh, of a certain percentage of their GDP. And 23 out of the 32 have met that, but nine are still working to attain that. But in any event, <clears throat> even to suggest that the United States would not fulfill its treaty obligation under Article 5 to come to the aid of any country under any member country under military attack is pretty shocking. That's a unilateral obligation, uh, excuse me, abrogation, a unilateral <laughs> abrogation of a commitment we first made in 1949 and have honored uh, up, to this, up to this point. On the other hand, if Kamala Harris, who, by the way, is coming to Ripon on this Thursday, uh, as you may have heard, along with Liz Cheney, a lifelong Republican, uh, if she were to win the presidency, that does not mean there would not be any changes made. Uh, there are some common sense adjustments that NATO probably needs to make in order to uh, progress into the future given new challenges uh, and new threats elsewhere in the world. But we will take a look at those, those things. So yes, it does depend, but uh, we'll have to take a little bit closer look at some of the variables that we need to consider here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, this is, I want to give a little background first. This is history, but this is a very important map. And I know, I realize I do show a lot of visuals, and I maybe too many, but I am kind of of the school of thought that I should provide evidence to support the things I say. I guess that's kind of old school, huh? Is that old hat now? I do sometimes wonder what my life would have been like if I could have just said whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, and never paid any attention to whether it had any resemblance to truth whatsoever. Just say whatever I thought made me look good. What a wonderful life, huh? Maybe I would have become president. <laughs> this shows you what was happening at the end of World War II. And by the way, I'm not a big fan of war, and we're going to see the tremendous costs of the war in Ukraine in a minute. But World War II is by far the most destructive in human history. I ran across this fact the other day. <clears throat> uh, if you take every single hour of every single day for the full six years of this war, starting September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, the average number of deaths per hour were 1,200. 1,200 deaths caused by violence for six years. And I also saw a picture of Dresden, Germany today in May of 1945, totally destroyed. And we know Japanese cities were totally destroyed. So the war has tremendous costs in human terms and in material terms. But in any event, uh, by the end of 1943, the Russians had advanced to this line here. They had turned back the Wehrmacht in Stalingrad, a great battle. If you want to see that, uh, there's actually a, a visual of that in a movie called Enemy at the Gates. 
They came out about 2001 uh, with uh, Jude Law and Ed Harris. It depicts this battle very accurately. I wasn't in the battle, but I've been, I've been to Stalingrad. I've been to the museum. And I've seen the pictures, and I saw the descriptions. A uh, very good movie to get a feel for that. But turning the Germans back, then Kursk was a huge tank battle a couple of months later. And thousands and thousands of German tanks were destroyed. And so then the Red Army kept progressing. And this is where they were uh, at the end of 1944. Kursk, by the way, Ukraine, that is where they have launched an, a, an attack on Russian soil. So that is just over the Ukraine, present-day Ukrainian uh, border with um, Russia. Uh, but you can see that by the end of 1944, they were well into Central and Eastern Europe. And then, uh, did I advance this? No, okay. Yeah, and here, here was the, um, the red badges. Those are all Soviet Red Army units. And you can see they're totally dominating. Yes, a few green ones, those are the US of A, one Canada here, a couple British, a few Yugoslav, but overwhelming force here by the Soviet Union Red Army. And this is one that uh, is very important to take a look at. So the red color here is the Soviet Union before the war started. The red is what this, uh, slightly less red element here is what they added to their own country. So they annexed the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, a significant part of Poland. Now it was made into what was called the Ukrainian SSR and the Byelorussian SSR at the time. But that's all part of the Soviet Union. Uh, and this one here, Anybody know what that little enclave is? Danzig? Sorry? Danzig? No. Uh, Danzig is in Poland. It's about there. You're close. That today is called Kaliningrad. It's part of Russia. And it's still Russia today. Yes. Uh, well, I'll talk more about that later. But after the Soviet Union collapsed, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia got their independence. But Kaliningrad remained part of Russia. And this is a very vital 65 mile stretch here between Belarus, as we call it now, and Kaliningrad. They took that from Germany. That was formerly part of East Prussia. It was called Königsberg. And that is where, for example, the philosopher Immanuel Kant lived his entire life. He never left Königsberg, but now it's part of Russia called Kaliningrad. We see that Poland, now the lighter pink countries all became satellites. They're not part of the Soviet Union, but they're controlled by the Soviet Union through communist governments that they installed uh, in all of these. Uh, and Poland got some new territory to the east and north, but lost territory to, the, excuse me, to the west and north, but lost territory to the uh, east. But these new borders and plus the capture of all these Soviet satellite states were very important. This is why NATO had to be formed. Uh, down here, this is called Istria. And that was to where Trieste was. The city of Trieste was divided between Yugoslavia and Italy. So Western responses to all this, the containment doctrine, or the, and also the Truman doctrine, this was kind of a middle of the road approach. Some people like George Patton advocated rollback, that we should attack the Soviet Union and roll them back out of Central and Eastern Europe, roll communism back. But again, the price at the time was considered too high. We'd just gone through a tremendous war, both in Europe and in Asia, for the United States and for other allies. Just, did we really want to start World War III? Uh, a war we probably couldn't win, 
and a war that by after 1947 would involve nuclear weapons when the Soviet Union got them. So rollback was a minority position. Detente was the idea, continue the friendship with the Soviet Union. They had been our ally. They were fighting Germany from 1941 on. Uh, so maybe we can continue to be friends. Just you know, let them have what they want, and maybe they'll be happy. But that was rejected also by the majority. The second thing that was adopted was the Marshall Plan, extremely important. A lot of money in those days, about $173 billion. These were loans to the uh, 18 countries mentioned. Uh, the thinking behind this was not merely humanitarian, although in part it was to help them rebuild. As you can see, much of Europe was in ruins. But also, without a functioning economy, even the farm fields had been bombed into oblivion. Uh, the European countries were falling into poverty. And in conditions of poverty, communism was making inroads even within the Western European countries. Communist Party of Italy was getting 30, 33% of the vote in some of those early elections. Uh, Communist Party of France was getting 20% of the vote. Uh, so the idea was we have to get these countries back on their feet. Also, that will help us because if they have money, they can buy our goods. And we can export farm products to them, machinery to them until their factories get rebuilt, help our country not fall into back into the Depression, which we had just gotten out of in part because of military spending in the war effort. So Marshall Plan, extremely important. By the way, every penny of that money that was lent was paid back with interest. So no, it was not, we were not taken advantage of. And then the third element was forming NATO. So here are some of the events in the early Cold War. Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, Berlin Blockade, which is depicted here, lasted about a year. The Berlin Airlift overcame that. April 49, NATO treaty signed. August 49, first Soviet nuclear test. Then China is captured by Mao Zedong and the Communist Party. So here we have Stalin and Mao shaking hands. That's a big threat in Asia now. And certainly a huge part of the Eurasian landmass controlled by our ideological enemies. And finally, the Korean War, which was no small thing started in 1950. So we have a lot of bad things going on today, but those were very fraught times as well, with a lot of very dangerous and threatening things happening. So this is when NATO was first formulated. Uh, began with the United Kingdom, France, and the Benelux countries. Then invited U.S. and Canada to join. They were the joint, joined by Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Italy, and Portugal. Even though Portugal was a military uh, strongman dictatorship at the time, uh, but it made 12 original members that are depicted in blue. 1955, in response, the Soviet Union established the Warsaw Pact, and. Uh, <clears throat> this was to be the counterpart to NATO of the satellite countries uh, here in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so this was the standoff that we had starting in the 1950s. Now, as we can see, by today, NATO has expanded dramatically. Uh, basically, uh, the idea behind NATO to deter Soviet aggression beyond what it had already conquered in Eastern and Central Europe. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll talk about the expansion more a little bit later. But as you can see today, it's pretty extensive. Canada and US, but now Sweden and Finland just joined very recently. But we added the former Soviet satellites, most of them in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, Turkey was added early on, 
and Greece, Spain a bit later after the Franco dictatorship came down. But so today, and we have all the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, the only countries in Europe that are not in NATO are Ireland, Switzerland, Austria, Serbia, Kosovo, and then some of the smaller island countries in the Mediterranean. In the former Yugoslav Republic, Slovenia, Croatia, Montenegro, Northern Macedonia, and Albania are all within NATO. And this would show you the dates of the expansion, which I won't go into detail on right now, but you can see the former satellite states uh, were added mainly in the 90s and early 2000s. The purposes, obviously deter the Soviet expansion, but also prevent a revival of nationalist militarism in Europe and to encourage European political integration. Now this was the first external defensive commitment ever made by the United States. Never made this kind of an ironclad treaty uh, agreement of mutual assistance ever before. It was firmly enmeshed in the, excuse me, in the, uh, whoops, United Nations framework. And as I said, one original member was a military dictatorship. Now, democracy is a requirement to be admitted. I'm not going to read this, but these are the main provisions that they will abide by the UN Charter. Uh, they will attempt to settle any international dispute in, by peaceful means. Uh, and they will refrain from the use of force except in self-defense. But Article 3 goes on to say that they will separately and jointly by means of continuous and effective self-help and mutual aid develop their individual and collective capacity to resist armed attack. And this is the most important Article 5. The parties agree that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all and will assist the party or parties so attacked by taking forth with individually and in concert with the other parties such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force, to restore and maintain the security of the North Atlantic area. So it doesn't absolutely commit them to a military response, but it says uh, that should be considered. And uh, this, is, But the main commitment is that attack on one is an attack on all. All right, this is the structure. I'm not going to go through this too much, but uh, Secretary General is the CEO, basically, running the organization who is selected by the council. The council sets the policy. How do they make decisions? How do they decide whether to send troops to a certain place or another? Through discussion and consensus. And ultimately, all the members have to agree. So, for example, all the members had to agree to admit both Finland and Sweden. And if you were following that, Finland didn't seem to be much of a problem, but Sweden was somewhat of a problem for Hungary with its strongman uh, president these days, uh, Prime Minister, rather, Viktor Orban, and also Turkey. Turkey didn't like the fact that Sweden had given amnesty to some Kurds who had uh, fought against the Turkish government, Kurds as a separatist uh, ethnic group on the, in the, living within Turkey and some of those other countries adjoining there. But I think we just had the change of Secretary General today. So Jens Stoltenberg of Norway handed over the ancient Icelandic gavel that they used to signify the, the control of the organization to Mark Ruta of the Netherlands, who uh, served as prime minister of the Netherlands for two separate occasions in a total of 14 years. So he's very experienced, and all of those governments were coalition governments. So he has to know how to negotiate and try to get a consensus, which is what he also has to do uh, as the decision-making process in NATO. 
Now here's, <clears throat> here's the thing that some people don't understand. NATO has two budgets. One are the common charges. Those would be your dues. So this is what you need to pay to keep the organization running each year. About 2,000 full-time equivalent day-to-day -day staff. They have some aircraft, some drones. The grand total here was only 2.7 billion, divided among members proportional to GDP. Um, I say only 2.7 billion, but I mean, compared to other military expenses, that isn't really very much. And in 2019, the formula was revised so that the U.S. contribution is no longer proportional to our GDP, but rather reduced to about 16% of the total, the same share as Germany, even though our economy is three times as big uh, as that of Germany, at least. So why did they do that? Well, I'm, I'm sure some of you are parents, right? You ever do something just to stop the whining? <laughs> I think you probably have, and I think that's, no, I think it's also this trying to accommodate uh, someone who's unhappy and uh, shows they're at least willing to do something like that. Now, when it comes to mission deployment, and we'll see some examples of that very shortly, each member decides its own contribution and pays for it. So if it's Denmark, they decide how many troops, if NATO commits to putting some troops into Afghanistan, which they did for the entirety of that war er, uh, effort from 2001 up until just a couple of years ago, but they decide how many they're gonna send and they also can put in what are called caveats. In other words, our soldiers can't go in certain regions or our soldiers can only fire if fired upon or some other restriction. So that can make things a little bit difficult. Uh, but the United States, at our own volition, we were willing, rightly or wrongly, to put 68,000 troops in Afghanistan. I just picked that one year as an example costing 3.6 billion per month or 43 billion per year. But no one was forcing us to do that. That was our own decision. And we decided how much it would be, how many troops there would be, uh, and what, what their role would be. And the same for all the other members that did put troops there or anywhere else. So in other words, there's not a loss of sovereignty here. There's still a great deal of leeway for each of the individual members. Now, here's the thing. In 2006, the members committed to spend at least 2% of GDP on defense. And that, I think, is what I referred to earlier, frankly, Mr. Trump. It is true that some of the countries have not reached that goal yet. But that is not money they owe us. That is not money they owe Brussels or the NATO Council, uh, that is just their own political process that they have to convince their members of their parliament or other legislative body to raise the defense spending to 2%, and most of them have. So as we can see here, again, the light blue is 2014, 10 years ago. The dark blue is today. And almost all of them, except the United States, have increased the percentage, some of them dramatically, like Poland. Uh, but if you look, almost all the dark lines are considerably. So they've been increasing. And even the ones that are still below the 2% guideline have been increasing. Uh, here we have Spain is the lowest, 1.28. Uh, Luxembourg. I'm not sure what the Luxembourg forces look like, frankly. It's a tiny, tiny country. <clears throat> but they, they, have, they could afford it. I, they just, how much room do they have for tanks in Luxembourg? I don't think there's much, enough room for many tanks. <clears throat> Another guideline that wasn't mentioned is that at least 20% of that military budget should go to equipment. 
So not just personnel, not just soldiers, but actual tanks, artillery, planes, boats. And again, most of them have reached that now. Only two that haven't, Canada and Belgium. So they're, they're, they're improving. But it is true that the United States still has the highest spending on military uh, around 755 that's in 2015 prices compared to 430 that's for the rest of NATO Europe and Canada so we are, are we do spend more but we're the, we have by far the biggest economy and we also have other obligations not everything that we're spending on our military goes to NATO by any means we have you know forces and aircraft carriers obviously in the Middle East we're obviously very concerned about East Asia these days, even the Indian Ocean, and to say nothing of the uh, South China Sea, Taiwan, all these other concerns. Uh, but I think a valid argument for change, in my judgment, is that because of all these other commitments, Europe should perhaps be carrying more of the NATO burden, since that is specific, as it states in the treaty charter, to to the Europe and North Atlantic area. That, to me, is a reasonable thing. Uh, but to just unilaterally threaten to abrogate the uh, treaty because you don't like what somebody's doing, uh, that, I think, is far less acceptable. So again, just to show you, now this is only the Canada and European nations but you can see, especially since 2014, they've really increased their military spending. And each time here that we're adding a country, well, then that adds their defense budget into the total, so that helps the curve go up. But, you know, again, this is what's brought them up to the $430 billion uh, that they are sp spending on their military today. Now, again, there's a concern about the United States and can we afford to be in NATO anymore. But here, this is not the NATO nations. This is the OECD. These are the top, most advanced 35 nations uh, in the world today. And you can see that our level of taxation is very near the bottom. Uh, there's only one other NATO country that is taxing itself at a lower percentage than the United States, and that's Turkey. But all the rest are already taxing themselves more. Denmark is way up there, 45% of GDP. So the argument that the United States, again, we're all taxpayers. Do I enjoy paying taxes? No. But we need to recognize that other people are actually paying a higher burden of taxes than we are. Now, <clears throat> what I want to say here is the first phase of NATO was clearly successful. The main objective was to deter further Soviet expansion in Europe or the North Atlantic, and that was prevented. Now, deterrence means somebody doesn't do something because they know the consequences will be too bad. The price will be too high. And so the Soviet leaders knew that any incursions into NATO countries, there would be an immediate reaction of all, uh, you know, against them, of all the members. And it did work. They did not do it. And eventually, what George Kennan had predicted, the Soviet Union did, and the Eastern European dictatorships did collapse from within. Now it took 45 years and the people who had to live under those regimes paid a price for that. But again, what was the alternative? Roll back? Try to actually attack and have World War III with nuclear weapons? I don't think that was a good idea. It was not ideal. I didn't want those captive nations, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, to have to live under the Soviet thumb. They had been independent since 1918. 
And now all of a sudden, 1945, 1946, now they're part of the Soviet Union. Uh, I know they didn't enjoy it, and I wouldn't have wished it on them. But it was the reality of the correlation of forces after the end of World War II that there really was nothing reasonable that could be done to prevent it at the time. But George Cannon believed, whose father went to Ribbon College, by the way, just to make yet another shameless plug. Uh, he, George Cannon, said that with vigilance, the contradictions, the inefficiencies will ultimately bring them down. And ultimately, he was right. But the other thing I need to mention here is that we did have to accept the Soviet sphere of influence in its satellite countries. So when they intervened in Czechoslovakia, for example, during the Prague Spring of 1968, I'm sure some of you remember that, uh, we really couldn't do anything about that. They're not a member of NATO. Uh, again, that would have been a causus belli for World, World War III, probably. Uh, and so we did not intervene. Uh, we let them keep their heel on their satellites and the captive nations uh, during this period of time. But it did prevent, it was successful in that it did prevent World War III from breaking out. It did prevent them further making aggression. And it, um, with the passage of time, led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But when that happened in the 1990s, then there was a kind of uh, very optimistic view. I mean, for a while, you remember Boris Yeltsin was not antagonistic to the United States. And uh, we, th you know, we thought that Russia was maybe on the way to democracy. And they had a rough transition from a planned economy to a market economy, but so did some of the others. But ultimately, it was successful. We thought it might be there as well. And then the issue came up, given this new environment, should NATO expand? And this is where some people argue today that this was a mistake. And even at the time, my personal belief was that this should not be rushed if Russia really now was not a threat. And by the way, Russia's military forces after the collapse of the Soviet Union were a mere fraction of what they had been under the Soviet Union. And again, I saw this personally. I was visiting a friend in the former East Germany in the summer of 1991, and there were Soviet soldiers all over the place. Now Russian, of course, because the Soviet Union doesn't exist. But they're sitting there with all their equipment, their uniforms, their guns, landmines, <laughs> all kinds of stuff, and they're not being paid because the Russian government has no money to pay them. So I was with my friend in the former East Germany out in the country, went to a nice little tavern, uh, had a beer and some sausage, I guess, and a Russian soldier came up and offered to sell us a box of hand grenades. <laughs> I mean, that's how, and they would sell you their guns, they would sell you their uniform, they'd sell anything. You know what they were asking for? Five dollars a piece. Box of ten, fifty dollars. Did you buy them? <laughs> I didn't think I could sneak it back in my suitcase. I know nothing about that stuff. I would. Uh, we got away from him as fast as we could. Tell you the truth, but no, it that definitely actually happened. So, uh, but here's here I think was the bottom line, both then and today. The people of these former Eastern European satellites wanted to be in NATO. And they were, for the most part, democracies. It was reflecting the majority will of the people. And they desperately wanted to be in NATO. And NATO had, and still has, an open door policy. If you meet the requirements, you can be considered for membership. And so how could we turn them down? Ideally, we probably shouldn't have pushed it quite so fast, but they were demanding it. And I believe it's their sovereign right to join any damn treaty they want. And that's what they wanted to do. And it's the same for Ukraine today. Uh, 
But these are the requirements. Functioning democratic system, market economy, fair treatment of minorities, commitment to peaceful resolution of conflicts, ability and willingness to make a contribution to NATO operations, any commitment to democratic civil military relations and institutional structures. So again, it takes several years of, of consideration by the NATO Council, but all these countries were allowed to join gradually, you know, bit by bit. Now, NATO having been successful in deterring aggression throughout the entire period of the Cold War, NATO forces were not involved in a single military engagement. However, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 of 2001 led to the first ever invoking of Article 5. So NATO forces then were involved in Afghanistan and Iraq for a number of years. Now, during the 90s, though, and the 2000s, NATO took on other missions and other operations, not combat related, but more of a peacekeeping or other nature. As we mentioned some here, counter piracy in the Red Sea, no fly zone in Libya, Pakistan, earthquake relief, and so forth. And so actually we don't have time to go through these in any detail, but even currently there are NATO forces still in Iraq trying to keep the peace in Kosovo. Operation Sea Guardian is uh, protecting shipping in the Mediterranean. There, there are some forces in Africa trying to, uh, again, peacekeeping function and securing allied airspace. Some of the others in the past, the one in Afghanistan obviously did not work out that well, uh, but there were a number of others. Some were successful, some were not. But now with the invasion of Ukraine, the focus is back on Europe and the central function deterring war, now not from the Soviet Union, but primarily from Russia. So how do we NATO stack up against Russia militarily? Well, actually, NATO is much, much stronger, combining the forces of all 32 countries. So f almost 6 million military personnel compared to 1.3 million. Tanks are about even. But as we'll see, uh, Russia's already lost over 4,000 tanks in Ukraine, but they're trying to make them as fast as they can, and they are getting help from some of their allies. Navy is overwhelming force for NATO. Aircraft carriers, most of them American, and aircraft. So NATO is very much a match for Russia militarily. There's no question. If you look at the defense spending, uh, this is actually GDP of NATO it is about way up here, 50 trillion. Russia's down here, maybe four, five trillion. So now, this is mislabeled. It says GDP. It's actually military spending. So this is the total NATO military spending, much more. But even take the United States out. NATO, excluding the USA, if they were spending the 2%, they would be here, and Russia is here, or actual, even with the ones that aren't quite at 2% yet, it's still significantly more. So NATO has an edge, no question. Uh, how about nuclear weapons? Well, that's about even. If you take, Russia has a few more than the US, but if you add in France and UK, that's about pretty, pretty equal. Okay, Russian invasion of Ukraine. <clears throat> There's a lot of debate, obviously, about this. This isn't our main topic, but um, there are people, led by John Mearsheimer of the University of Chicago, who believes that NATO expansion is what mainly caused Russia to invade Ukraine. He argues that uh, Putin felt threatened, had drawn a red line, Ukraine simply cannot join NATO, and when it looked like they might be moving in that direction, uh, he decided to invade. Now, I do not believe that Putin, some also say, to arguing in a different way, that Putin wants to reestablish the Soviet 
empire. And that I do not accept either. That's way too ambitious. I mean, you talk about bringing back Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. Uh, no, but I do think the Baltic states might be threatened because when the Soviet Union controlled them, they moved a lot of Russian people into those countries. And so they might come up with a, some kind of a justification uh, for an invasion there. So that is where I think NATO uh, can play a very major role in deterring that and making sure that doesn't happen. Obviously, I think Putin did feel the Ukrainian government would crumble. And that is why he initially, these are the initial attacks. This is Kyiv, the capital. And, you know, they were right there. Now, Ukraine was able to force them out. But I'm sure he thought, if I get this close to Kyiv, they'll collapse and we'll get a more friendly government back in Ukraine. Again, it's kind of a long story, but Ukraine has had a lot of twists and turns. So they had a pro-Soviet dictator back in the early 2000s. He was overthrown by the Orange Revolution and more democratic people were brought into power in Ukraine in 2004. But they made a hash of things. They were corrupt themselves. Some of them ended up in prison for taking bribes and so forth. And so that allowed uh, another pro-Soviet person to be elected. And there were negotiations both with Russia and with the European Union. Which way will Ukraine go? And the pro-Soviet, or excuse me, pro-Russian Yanukovych at first was talking with the European Union about applying for membership. But then at the last minute, he switched and said he would join a Soviet trade agreement instead. Uh, it's not Soviet Russian. He, he would join a pro-Russian trade agreement. That's when the people erupted again. And now we had the Maiden Revolution, and he was forced out of the country. And now new democratic elections were held. Well, you know, this is kind of inner turmoil on the part of the Ukrainians themselves. If they had been more unified and more efficient at what they were trying to do, uh, they might have been able to pull it off. But when Yanukovych was forced out of the country in 2014, that's when Putin started to move. That's when he annexed Crimea, uh, which admittedly traditionally had not been part of Ukraine. That is true. Ukraine only got that in 1954. That had been part of Russia. But again, in 1954, when Khrushchev, a Ukrainian, after Stalin's death, uh, maneuvered to give Ukraine the Crimea, it didn't make any difference because these supposedly autonomous regions were all run from Moscow anyway. So whether Crimea is in, technically in the Russian Federation or in the Ukrainian Socialist Republic, it didn't really make any difference. But when Ukraine becomes independent, now it makes a difference. Now, it's, now Ukraine can actually make decisions regarding it, uh, which they couldn't before. But Crimea was the first, but then he, remember the little green men started to move into these provinces in uh, eastern Ukraine. In terms of aid to Ukraine, the United States has given the most, but if you actually add up these European totals, it's actually more. So they've actually contributed at, uh, to this time about 105 billion to our 75 billion. And I know we have legislation to expand that, but it, ha they have, it hasn't been approved as of yet. And again, we don't have time to go into the all the details here, but um, these are the Russian positions as of last week. And these are the uh, Ukrainian incursion in blue into the Kursk region. That's up, uh, that's about up here. So um, this is the, the war is going on. It is not uh, going as Putin had intended, I'm sure of that, but it's also not anywhere near a slam dunk that Ukraine can win a clear-cut victory either. 
Uh, in terms of nationalism, uh, there are pockets, especially Crimea, but also in the disputed areas of Russians, uh, a few other minorities, Bulgarian, and so forth. So there, are, there's, there is some reason for Crimea to be part of Russia. But for the rest, I think it's much harder to make that case. The cost, very high. So there's a lot of different estimates, but according to The Economist, it looks like this is time up over, well over 100,000 dead Russians <clears throat> as of last month. Over a half million injured uh, and killed added together. So over 100,000 deaths in 1,000 days, uh, that's a lot. And again, consider the United States and Vietnam lost about 58,000 dead of our soldiers. And that was very traumatic for us to go through. Imagine this, in just 1,000 days, but then that also lasted quite a few years. Here in just 1,000 days, they've already lost 100,000 or more dead. Uh, and that's big compared to their other conflicts. So again, low estimate, 106,000. Compared to this many they lost in Chechnya, this many in Afghanistan, and this many before the invasion in Ukraine with the little green men and so forth fighting in the south. High estimate would be the bigger square of 140,000. So he's paid a tremendous price. I don't think if he knew that it was going to be this high, I don't know if he would have done it. They've also lost a lot of equipment, over 3,000 tanks, a lot of other mobility vehicles, so forth. So tremendous losses. We've put a lot of sanctions on them. The sanctions have slowed their economic growth very considerably. Uh, but they're still growing, although slowly. And they're getting help from certain allies like China, like Iran, North Korea. You know, they're helping them economically as well as militarily. Okay, finally, NATO has responded with its own force increases on its eastern flank. So these are the eight new uh, forces put in place by NATO. Uh, right here, all in these countries, you can see uh, many thousands of troops. High readiness forces now are half a million across all these domains. Uh, and we increased the number of battle groups from four to eight. And those are all, we don't have time to go through the details, but NATO is not standing by doing nothing. They are very much bolstering and building up their forces on the eastern flank. They had military exercises earlier this year, very extensive. Uh, so they're preparing in case they're needed. This is one of the real uh, danger points between Kaliningrad, which I had mentioned, and Belarus, the Sulwaki Gap. It's only 65 miles. If the Russians could close that off, they could keep NATO re reinforcements. And this is why these are the most vulnerable countries today of the NATO members, the Baltic states. But now we have to the north, Finland and Sweden. That's big. And if Vladimir Putin carried out his invasion because of a fear of NATO expansion, well, unfortunately, he pulled off a self-fulfilling prophecy because nations that wanted to remain neutral earlier, such as Sweden and Finland, have now joined NATO and given them that northern flank, which they did not have before. And <clears throat> in addition, other countries like Poland, even though Poland has had a very conservative government for some of the recent time period, not at the moment, but they did law and justice for a number of years. Uh, as right-wing as they are, they aren't fond of Russia. 
So there's total consensus in Poland to build up their military. And they are vital members of NATO. And that is another reaction that has taken place that is against Russian interests, but provoked by their actions. This is what a war might look like in 2044, but frankly, we don't have time to really look at that or speculate about that. Uh, a mo the most recent thing, Germany and the United States just in July of this year agreed to put intermediate range, medium range ballistic missiles back into Germany, which had been pulled out in the 1990s. They are now going to go back and they can hit parts of the Soviet Union up to Moscow and even beyond in some cases. So this is another extremely uh, potent part of NATO's deterrent, which is being put into place today. So finally, we do have a lot of uncertainties, uh, especially in US politics. Can't necessarily take US leadership of NATO for granted. Uh, NATO expansion may have influenced Russia's invasion, but their actions have solidified, expanded, and reinforced Europe's commitment to collective security. Certain assumptions we made about the advance of Western liberal ideology, we will have to re-examine. A Europe whole and at peace will be a greater challenge than we thought in the 1990s. But the ability to deter further aggression in Europe is there. Only the political will to use it is in question. Thank you. Okay, question, Professor. One question and one comment. The question is, that you talked about the Marshall Plan, 1949 NATO. Also, the United States ratified the Geneva Convention in 1949. Geneva Convention and NATO, do they complement each other, or is it apples and oranges? Uh, I, I, well, I think they complement each other, but they're separate. So I guess um, that's actually, that's one I would have to look into some of the intricacies of because NATO membership, as I did mention, Article 1, commitment to the United Nations and its procedures and principles. And I believe the Geneva Accords came out of the United Nations. So I think in that sense, it may be true that membership in NATO implies uh, you know, accepting the Geneva Conventions. So I think I, I have to look into it in more detail, though, to really, to really nail down the exact relationship. Well, I read the four principles of the Geneva Convention. They don't exist in today's world, okay? They don't. They're supposed to complement each other, but they don't. My comment is I'm not here to argue with you when you said, because I didn't bring my notes, okay? World War II, devastation, money, the Jewish people, everything. The one thing we weren't doing was killing ourselves, our own brothers and sisters, like we did in the Civil War. So yes, World War II was devastating, but we weren't killing each other. Well, I think uh, also I will just quickly add that in terms of the percentage of the U.S. population that was killed or severely injured, it was the highest in the Civil War. But that's partly because, you know, we were both sides there. And, you know, Russia lost more in World War II than we did. Now, we lost about half a million. The Soviets, again, civilian and military, it was over 20 million. So we didn't suffer the most uh, because it wasn't fought on our turf other than Pearl Harbor. But uh, nevertheless, on a global scale, from all the countries involved and all the parties involved, World War II was the most violent and the most destructive. OK, another question? There was once an agreement that was called the Budapest Accord. And uh, with that uh, agreement, we, the United States, and Britain 
agreed with Ukraine that if Russia invaded Ukraine, we would protect or support Ukraine. And we are. I don't think, I know what you're talking about, that was 2008, uh, the Bucharest Declaration. But I don't, I, I don't think it committed us in the same way as that an attack on Ukraine would be considered an attack on the United States and United Kingdom. No, that, but, that wasn't it. It was, uh, but it's, it didn't have nothing to do with attack on the United States. It was uh, if you no. attacked uh, Ukraine, because uh, when that agreement was started, Putin was afraid of Ukraine because Ukraine had all of the armament after World War II. They had more equipment for military than Russia had. And Putin was afraid of Ukraine. That's why he agreed with, he tried to get Britain and United, I mean, Britain and the United States agreed that if he, uh, he invaded Ukraine, we would support Ukraine. Yes, and they are. Yeah. I, it was not the same, though, as what I was trying to say. It was not the same as Article 5. We didn't agree to treat an attack on Ukraine as an attack on us. That would require NATO membership, which they don't have and didn't have. So. Uh, we, I'm familiar with the Bucharest Declaration, and I believe we're following it the, the best that we can. Look, there, there, there's a very severe danger here of what has happened in Ukraine up till now uh, has been very bad. And I didn't even talk about the destruction of you know, buildings, hospitals, schools, just horrendous. But, uh, you know, even the loss of life has been horrendous. But, <clears throat> excuse me, it also wouldn't be that hard for it to even escalate more up to and possibly even including nuclear weapons. So that is why we have to exercise some caution. So, again, some are urging that we give Ukraine missiles that could hit so uh, Russian cities, just as they are hitting Ukrainian cities. So on one level, that would be, f that would be fair. But on another level, uh, if it provokes Russia into even possibly using tactical nuclear weapons, now you're going to see even a much more destructive thing. And it could conceivably escalate uh, even into a really huge, even much bigger war than it is already. So this is why it has to be handled carefully. We do not, in my opinion, we do not want to let Putin win. But if we go too far, like send our own troops there, uh, then, which France has actually advocated, uh, then I think we run a risk of escalation that is extremely dangerous. And, you know, I do not stand here and tell you that I have ex cathedra knowledge of what we should do. This is a very difficult situation. Uh, again, as I've said, I think if Putin knew what the price was going to be and that he was not going to be successful, I believe what he really wanted was to make sure Ukraine didn't join the EU and join economically with the rest of Europe. He wanted them to turn east. And as his friend, the, part, the president for a number of years, Yanukovych, tried to do that. But the people of Ukraine rebelled against that and overthrew him. And so that's not acceptable. But that's what he was trying to do, trying to make sure Ukraine not only didn't join NATO, but didn't join the European Union and kept economically allied with Russia. But the price he has paid for that, and secondly, is very high. And secondly, it's failed. So it's been a bust from his viewpoint, but we don't want to turn it into World War III either. Yeah, Go ahead.
I've been following the Wall Street Journal story on Ukraine and Russia. And uh, uh, Russia has had enormous problems internally of, in the city of, and the country of Russia. Uh, the soldiers that they employed from the prison, yeah. uh, they are, they're, they're getting to be professional criminals in there. There was a story in the Wall Street Journal where this man was coming home and he, uh, his car broke down. And uh, he called his wife and he said, uh, the car broke down, but I got some guys here and they're fixing it for me. Those, those guys were what's traveling in Russia's uh, uh, highways. Uh, and when they fixed it, they shot him. And they took his car. That story was in the Wall Street Journal. I, I know what you're and talking the, about. And uh, the crime in Russia is just out of hand. Well, I've been in Russia several times, and uh, it's better than it was in the mid-'90s when things were really desperate. But yes, Russia has conscription, and they have conscripted, that means drafted, convicts. So you're in prison. No, <laughs> now you're, you're out of prison, but you're going to fight in Ukraine on the front lines. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I read in, in the casualties, I read that 17,000 of those have been killed. Out of the, so that's about 17% or, or so of the deaths of the Russian soldiers have been conscripted convicts. So it, it is something that is, yeah, I, is very significant. I, I know, uh, like... Um, I was a friend of uh, Dr. Ashby. Ash, uh, he was a OG. He was delivered babies. Yeah. And uh, he was a um, he was what he called boys of the forest. He was a boy of the forest in Estonia. And they, he says we hated Russians, and uh, they fought with them. They, you know. And uh, uh, all those countries are hate. I knew a guy real well from uh, Czech Republic. And uh, he said, you know, everybody hates Russia. Yeah, and especially Poland. Nobody more than in Poland. And that works to our advantage, regardless of which party is, is ruling in Poland. But I understand what you're saying. And th these are all, again, Putin wrote an article in 2021, just six months or so before the invasion, in which he argued that the Ukrainian nation was a myth. There was no such thing as Ukraine. It was always part of the Russian Empire, and therefore it didn't have the right to be a sovereign, independent country. Well, that's just false. The Ukrainian language is distinct from the Russian language. Yes, they use largely the same alphabet, but they're not mutually intelligible. Uh, you, you have to study the one from the other in order to learn it. Uh, their cultures, again, originally, but this goes back to the ninth century. <laughs> the founding of Russia, it was called the Kievan Rus because it was based around the, that very old city of Kiev, or Kiev as we call it today. <clears throat> but that state was actually founded by Vikings. <laughs> And they're the ones who came down. That's what the Rus means. It means rower uh, in Old Norwegian language. So the rowers came down the rivers and conquered the Slavic tribes and set up this government. But that only lasted a couple hundred years. And then the Mongol hordes came in and wiped them out. But Ukraine then evolved on its own before Russia really got strong as it, it later became. Russia used to control Finland. Does that mean they can go from 1808 until 1918? Does that mean they can go in and invade them now uh, because they owned them once? That has no more validity than the Chinese uh, seven dash line in the South China Sea, which again, they claim to be able to control because back in the Ming Dynasty, <laughs> they did control it. No that we have international maritime law that takes precedence over that. And we have, Ukraine was established in 1991 as a sovereign nation. And 
It has all the rights of a sovereign nation, including not to be invaded. Okay, maybe time for one more. One more? Okay. One more. Just get another one, Mike. Okay. Make sure first, can we make sure somebody that hasn't had one? Why would people come here and sit and not ask questions? Okay. Well, I just want to make sure they had a chance. So, you, you talk about uh, Marshall, an elder statesman, right? George Marshall? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if we have any here. I'm not talking about Trump, but I'm talking about great minds like Marshall. When they look at Ukraine, one says this, one says this. They're not in, it's not a political, how, who do you trust? Who do you believe? Well, I, I know, and there's disagreement even among people that I do respect. So, for instance, I do respect John Mearsheimer, and I read a lot of what he writes about this, but I, I have to disagree because uh, Ukraine was perfectly within their rights, just as all the other Eastern European nations were, to ask to be considered for NATO membership. That is what they themselves, as a sovereign people, decided they wanted. And no outside force has the authority to deny them that. Now, again, what Russia is trying to do is to go back to that old Soviet idea, not necessarily of totally owning the country, but at least this is my sphere of influence. Well, we, we can't uh, respect that anymore. Uh, we have sovereign nations that have the right of self-determination and they have the right to join any treaty organization, any economic organization, any common market, anything that they democratically decide to do. But I agree with you, we have differences of opinion, but that is why, hopefully, we have discussions like this. I'm not telling anybody in here what to think about it. I'm trying to give you some information, some background, but you think about it yourself. Uh, get other sources of information, consider it very carefully, and then you make up your mind and let your representative know uh, what you would like them to do. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs>